Hello, this is part four of the chapter 12 lecture. Um, picking up on page 265 on the topic of disposable packaging materials. So there are two types of packaging materials, effectively disposable and non-disposable. The non-disposable include rigid containers and muslin wrap and uh, a few other materials. Um, the disposables are very common. They include things like SMS, <coughs> which is called an engineered fabric, crepe paper, which is an engineered fabric, these things are uh, have been around since the 40s. And <clears throat> engineered fabrics include things like coffee filters, tea bags, vacuum cleaner bags, SMS wrap, medical grade papers. Okay, note before we go any further. Um, papers that contain cellulose cannot be used for all sterilization processes. Also, the blue box on page um, 265 points out that some uh, packaging materials may have expiration dates. So um, these are validations from the manufacturer. If the manufacturer validates their um, SMS wrap to maintain sterility for 180 days, then to use it after 180 days, um, or should I say, to consider the contents to be sterile after 180 days, you're taking the risk. You should go by the manufacturer's IFU. Okay, craft type papers. <clears throat> if you look at page 266 in your textbook, it shows something very common. These are little paper pouches. They're used for things like separating forceps from the other instruments, uh, small little instruments, parts of instruments, just to keep them separate and findable in a uh, in a set. So, <clears throat> paper, plastic, and spun bond polyolefin, polyolefin plastic pouches called peel pouches or peel packs are the most commonly used packaging materials for small instruments and lightweight items. So, if you have something like a Kelly or a pair of Kellys or a knife handle, um, you're, you're going to be peel pouching it unless it's part of a set. So if it's going into um, the steam or the ethylene oxide, you can use the paper and plastic combination. If it is going into a uh, low temperature process called Sterad or Vipro, these are using hydrogen peroxide, or an ozone sterilizer, you cannot use paper because the paper will absorb the sterilant and cause a sterilization failure. So um, for these things, we have polyolefin, also called Tyvek. Tyvek is the brand name of polyolefin. Polyolefin will not survive a sterilization cycle of steam or anything hot. Steam is hot. Steam is 270 degrees or 250, but it depends on the type of cycle you're running. <clears throat> um, so the polyolefin will actually melt in the steam sterilizer. Um, it's only appropriate for the low temperature processes. It is compatible with ethylene oxide but it is more expensive than paper plastic pouches, and therefore you probably won't be using it for ethylene oxide, but saving it for the hydrogen peroxide, steroid, or the uh, ozone process. So be sure that you're considering the method of sterilization when you're choosing your packaging material, always. So look at page 267. Now we're gonna start talking about how to peel pouch something. <clears throat> Peel pouches are usually used for small or lightweight items. We know that. They're also useful when it is important to see the contents of the package. Okay, let me stop right there. It may be important to see the contents of the package for the on the user end to be able to verify that they have the correct thing, but this does not mean that you do not have to write on the outside of the package what is in there. You should always do that. Never on the paper side or the Tyvek side but always on the plastic side, maybe right directly on the plastic or according to your facility's policy, um, they may want you to put a piece of tape on that and write on the tape and that's fine. So when you're doing a peel pouch, um, you may also want to use a tip protector. Tip protectors may help to keep the, uh, the instrument open. In the case of like a scissors, you want the scissors to be in an open position. Um, but they are also designed to protect the instrument's tips as well as the packaging itself. So 
a tip protector on something like a, uh, a Jacobson mosquito hemostat will definitely help to protect those very fine, delicate tips, but also the pouch itself because those tips are sharp. You should uh, try to choose the correct size and style of tip protector. So imagine you have chosen a tip protector that barely fits on an item. So what's gonna happen is when it goes through the steam, it's going to shrink a little bit and that makes it harder for the user to remove the tip protector. But also many of the items that you're packaging may have a hook to it, a sharp hook actually. So if they're trying to remove something where the, the tip protector has shrunk a little bit, it used to fit fine, but now it's shrunken and it makes it more difficult for the instrument to be released from the tip protector and they can either hurt themselves or damage the instrument or both. <clears throat> so when you're peel pouching something, um, I'm on page 268, when you are peel pouching something, make sure that the tip of the instrument, like let's say a straight scissors, okay, the tip, it's all straight. It doesn't matter which way you point it, but if the scissors is curved, the curve should be toward the plastic side, not the paper side for the simple reason that the paper side is more delicate. Both sides are delicate. The paper side is the more delicate. Um, that does not mean that the plastic is not going to uh, be subject to damage from the tips. So for mine, you know, tip, tip, tip protector should be available. Also, when you're placing the item into the pouch, look at the picture on page 268 and it says the chevron end of a peel pouch. So the scissors, or the other item that has ring handles. Hang on. Okay, sorry, I had to go out to the desert and get the instruments that I left out there. So um, if you're pouching something like a needle holder, see, this is the wide end, the grabbable end, the end that they will be holding on to when they're using it. This is the well, it's the distal tip. I usually call it the business end. It's the end that's going to be used. It's almost disappearing out here in the desert. Wow, no wonder it was so hard. It took me a long time to find this. Okay, never mind. Um, if you are pouching a scissors that looks like this, the same rules apply. Proximal end um, in use, the proximal end would go toward the chevron end of the pouch. Let me illustrate that for you. Chevron. Okay, so it goes here. All right. Something like this. It's not necessarily so much wider at one point. Is it obvious that this would need a tip protector? Uh, it would definitely need a tip protector. This. It is wider on the distal end, the business end. Um, this is the part that holds the ice cream, and this is the part that they would grab and hold on to as they're eating the ice cream. Do we have any ice cream? Nah, we'll get that later. <coughs> okay, um, believe it or not, there are spoons used in some surgical procedures, and believe it or not, you can look in the back of the spoon and it might say something like, made in China. Um, these procedures that use these are clean cases, they're not sterile cases. So let me end your concern right now. You will see in something like a DNC set or a urology tray that they have a spoon in there. It looks like it was once in the cafeteria. Uh, it says made in China or whatever. It's not a surgical instrument. You don't have to worry because they don't technically have to be sterile. You don't need instructions for use on those. Um, however, I would change that. I would change that if I could. Okay. <clears throat> okay, back. So <clears throat> when you are pl placing something in a pouch, and I don't have any pouches at home, but uh, we have a picture of a pouch in the book. So look at the picture on page 268 on the top, the toppermost picture where it says an instrument placed in a too small pouch can stress the edges of the package. When the package goes through the sterilization process, especially steam, well, and steroid as well, um, there's a vacuum stage and it causes the pouch to expand like that. 
Of course, it doesn't add extra material. It literally, just like my hands, whoa, can't find my camera. It's going to bring the edges of the pouches in and it's going to dissect the edges of the pouch. So why even bother? Place it in a pouch that has at least a quarter inch of space around the entire pouch. A quarter inch, quarter inch here, quarter inch here, quarter inch here, quarter inch here. Don't have to be too concerned about it remaining in the direct center of the pouch as long as it has enough room to breathe. The next picture on page 268, the middle picture, uh, it is very dark, but uh, I've seen scenarios like this. If you have something that is very small in a very large pouch, it doesn't matter that it's lightweight, somebody's gonna pick up the pouch and the thing on the inside is going to slide down and dissect its way right out of the pouch and then end up on the floor. There's no five second rule that applies here. The bottom picture, it makes me laugh every time I see it because I know what it is. It is not a pouch that was set up for sterilization. This happens all the time in sterile processing departments. It's not the best way to treat instruments, but you see it. Uh, somebody has taken a peel pouch and stuffed a bunch of unneeded clip of pliers into the pouch. However, they're using it to illustrate that it's just possible to overload a pouch. Don't do silly things like that and then expect it to become sterile. Okay, I had to get back inside my luxury apartment that overlooks the beautiful city of Los Angeles. Now, <clears throat> paper plastic pouches must be labeled. It doesn't matter that they can see through it. You still have to label it. Let me explain a possible scenario. Let's say you're packaging a laryngeal mask airway. And it clearly says on the laryngeal mask airway that it is a size 3 or a size 4 or a size 5. But if you don't write that number on the outside where it's nice and visible, um, it could inadvertently happen that a size 3 is pulled for a size 5. And if they need that in an emergency, it could end with the patient uh, a sentinel event which means the patient could die because they didn't have the right supplies. And there are other situations where instruments look very similar and you just look at it through a pouch and it's like, oh yeah, that, that's the whatever instrument. That's the, uh, that's the mosquito forceps. And as it turns out, it was actually a uh, vasectomy clamp. And a vasectomy clamp would do damage to the tissue they clamped it on instead of just uh, providing hemostasis. So yes, you know what the instrument is, tell them what the instrument is inside that pouch, even though they can see through the plastic. Um, now double pouches. Some hospitals will double pouch everything. I, I used to work at a hospital that is currently double pouching everything. And it doesn't matter that it is a small, tiny, lightweight knife handle. Um, it's going to get a double pouch. So the value of double pouching everything is it does make it easier for the OR to uh, open and present things aseptically. <clears throat> Asepsis is everything they do in setting up a, surgical, a surgery. So, um, oh, but another point before we move on to say more about double pouching, a wrap within a pouch. If the instructions for use on your wrap and your, um, <sighs> and your pouches, if the instructions for use allow it, you can take a small wrap and like I would probably do a pouch and a wrap with this because it has a sharp edge. There's no tip protector that's gonna come cover that sharp edge. Uh, so I'm going to put a tip protector here to cover the point, wrap it, and then put it into the pouch. So sometimes a wrap inside of a pouch is a good idea and acceptable, depending on IF use. Moving on, more about double pouch. Why do I double pouch? Because it uh, one thing, it provides an, a better opportunity to open things and present them aseptically. Another thing is, what if there's multiples of instruments? The picture on page 269 shows there are two ads and forceps inside of this pouch. So if there are two items inside of a pouch, the surgical tech can reach toward and take one item out of that pouch, or one maneuver, I should say. If the surgical tech can't take both items at the same time, then the other item in that pouch stays in that pouch. So <clears throat> from 
multiples also or uh, multiples because it could weigh a little bit more as well. There's going to be a weight limit on pouches. There's an IFU that comes with every box of pouches that tells you the weight limit for uh, each style of pouch. And the weight limit can even uh, be different depending on the method of sterilization. So IFUs for everything, they really exist. So on page 270, you see a picture of something is folded over. The inner pouch is folded over to fit inside of the outer pouch. So uh, I probably don't have to say this, but the inner pouch should easily fit inside the outer pouch um, and without folding over. Folding over a pouch can lead to drying issues. Now, when you see folded over pouches um, that come from a factory in California or whatever, so let me say uh, your facility purchases things already sterilized and they come from a factory somewhere else. Okay, They're, it's fine. The pouch can be folded over. Uh, they have validated that process and the fact of the matter is it is not going to cause drying issues with them because they probably sterilized it by radiation or ethylene oxide. For us, we do not fold over the pouch to make it fit. You choose the appropriate size pouches. Now we're on to wrapping. So there are several pages here where it just goes into the steps of wrapping. Look at them. See if you can mimic them at home with wrapping paper or a towel. A towel works fine for a, uh, for a square wrap, or for a square fold, because a towel is rectangular and it's fine as long as it's not a really huge beach towel that's really extra long. Um, but for a square, I'm sorry, for a uh, envelope fold, you're gonna want something square. So you can use a piece of leftover wrapping paper from last year's Christmas or birthday. Uh, cut a square and find something that fits inside of that square uh, completely and then start wrapping it, going by these steps. You see the picture on page 271 where it shows that square instrument set that's sitting in that wrap nice. And then uh, the tech goes in and wraps it beautifully, I might add. Okay, it's a good fit. So things that you can practice wrapping with include shoe boxes and books. Books make very good um, wrapping dummies. Books are rectangular. Almost everything you wrap seriously will be rectangular. Like nearly everything. It's, it's not every day that you wrap square items, but every day you're going to be wrapping rectangles. So the envelope fold works very good for this. Now, there are two methods of using flat wraps. One is a sequential. So a sequential means we're going to wrap it once and then wrap it again. So we're going to use two single wraps. Wrap it, don't tape it, and then wrap it again. Then tape that. Um, simultaneous means that the package is wrapped only once, but it requires a special double-layered synthetic non-woven material bound on two or four sides. Okay, a simultaneous wrap is not for using, uh, not to be done with single wraps. So what am I talking about? Single, double, simultaneous? So most of the wraps that you're gonna see out there in the field are actually two pieces of material that are bonded together by melting, uh, heat melted to each other so that they are become one. The minimum number of wraps you can use for something that is being terminally sterilized is two wraps. Now, if you have single wraps, then you're gonna be doing a sequential wrap. If you have the, um, the two that are bonded together, then you'll be doing a simultaneous wrap. Okay, the square fold is also called the inline or parallel fold and is the most frequently used, I'm sorry, it is most, it is not the most frequently used, it is most frequently used for larger packs and instrument trays. I worked in several hospitals and we just didn't do the square fold. It just wasn't a thing. We did it on one object. And it was a, um, what they called an ortho soak pen. 
So we had this soap pan that they would soak orthopedic instruments in during the case, they would put sterile water in the pan. And um, when they opened up that soap pan in the OR, they put it on a small back table and they used the wrap itself to create and complete a sterile field so that everything would be sterile. Uh, it is really not necessary to wrap in a square fold unless they intend to use that wrap as a sterile field. Almost everything is wrapped in an envelope fold, especially things that are small. So pretend this is inside of a wrap and I am an unsterile nurse and I'm going to present this to the tech. I'm going to open it, I'm going to pull all these flaps and I'm going to present the tech with the sterile scissors. I can't find my camera, okay. <clears throat> Envelope fold, you can't do that with a square fold. Moving on, you should know the difference between sequential simultaneous envelope and square. And I'd really appreciate it if you would find a way to practice all of these things. Okay, this is gonna be the end of the uh, uh, part four of this ch chapter 12 lecture. I'm going to pick up with the next lecture on methods of package closure. We'll see you soon.